Hello, John Perry here. I am back for yet another episode of Science vs. the Ark Encounter. In this much anticipated episode, we will take a look at Ken Ham's Mars exhibit. That's right. As odd as it might sound, an entire section of the Ark Encounter is dedicated to presenting evidence that Mars once had flowing water on its surface. In it, we read, Despite the fact that there is no known liquid water on the surface of Mars, many scientists believe that Mars once suffered a flood of biblical proportions. Ironically, many of these same scientists deny that Earth, a planet 70% covered with water, ever had a global flood. Now, it certainly is true that Mars seems to have once had an ocean on its surface, but do scientists really believe that Mars suffered, quote, a flood of biblical proportions? Continue watching to find out. Hello, good people of the internet. It's good to be back here doing another Science vs. the Ark Encounter video. I'm really excited about today's because today we're going to talk about Mars and the the really strange properties of Mars and the really strange properties of water that make it so that today liquid water cannot exist on the surface of Mars. If you were to take a, a bottle of water and open it up on the surface of Mars, it would not remain liquid. In the past, however, there is evidence that a huge ocean once existed on Mars. We're going to talk about this today, but first, I need to draw your attention to another exhibit at the Ark Encounter. And if I recall correctly, this exhibit is actually right next to the Mars exhibit. It's an exhibit on the nature of the flood according to Ken Ham's interpretation of the Bible. So a lot of you probably know that Ken Ham's interpretation of the Bible is not the only interpretation of the Bible that's out there. There are lots of Christians that believe that the flood happened, but it, it was a local event. It was not a global event. And there's a whole bunch of different variations of this that you can find in Christian literature. Ken Ham has an exhibit that makes fun of those other ideas because there's a, a verse in the Bible saying that the waters covered the mountaintops. And so he has this image right here mocking people that believe that there was a local flood and saying that this is what it would look like if there was a local flood that covered the mountaintops. And Ken Ham goes on to say that his interpretation of the Bible, it, and he thinks that his interpretation is the only legitimate interpretation of the Bible, According to his interpretation, a flood of biblical proportions is a flood where the entire planet is completely covered in water and all of the mountaintops are completely covered in water. This is what a flood of biblical proportions is, according to Ken Ham. Now, I want you to remember that. It might seem ir irrelevant right now, but remember that because we're going to come back to that later. Ken Ham defines a flood of biblical proportions as a global flood that covers all of the mountains with water. So, back to Mars. A few years back, there was a paper published in the journal Nature describing an overview of all the different lines of evidence that scientists have discovered, telling us that Mars once had a giant ocean on its surface. And in this paper, we learned that the ocean covered about one third of the planet. That's what we predict based on the um, observations that we have of water flow, ancient water flow on the surface of Mars. Now, again, there is no liquid water on the surface of Mars today. There is ice on the polar caps of Mars, and a lot of that ice is uh, CO2 ice. It's, uh, it's dry ice, and a lot of it is water ice. There's also liquid water under the surface of Mars, but on the surface of Mars, we have not found any significant bodies of liquid water, and we do not expect to find any significant bodies of liquid water. And so w when you learn this, you might be like, well, why on earth do we believe that there was water in the past? Well, we believe that there was water in the past because there's evidence of it. There's these valleys and different waterways that could only have been carved out, so far as we know, by large amounts of liquid. And by studying the composition of Mars, we think that that liquid was water. The reason that today Mars can no longer have liquid water on its surface is that Mars has lost its atmosphere. Evidence suggests that in the past, Mars had a nice thick atmosphere, possibly as thick as the atmosphere here on Earth. This nice thick atmosphere was what allowed Mars to have liquid water on its surface. Mars gradually lost its atmosphere for several reasons, one of which is that Mars is much smaller than Earth. And because it's smaller, and because gravity is a property of mass, 
Mars has less gravity than Earth does. And gravity is what keeps the gases in our atmosphere trapped close to the surface of Earth. And so on Mars, because there's that just less gravity, a lot of those gases were able to slowly just kind of bounce away and escape into outer space. Furthermore, Mars does not have a magnetic shield. Earth's magnetic shield protects us from solar winds. And so Mars is actually subject to all of the violence of solar winds. So solar winds are also knocking off gases and they're getting lost in space. And because of this, and there's a couple other reasons that have been proposed, uh, Mars over time lost its atmosphere. And, and without atmospheric pressure, liquid water cannot exist. So you probably learned in middle school, this is this here is a, a glass of water with some food coloring in it. You probably learned in middle school that water is made of a collection of molecules and that those molecules are constantly bouncing off of each other. So all these water molecules are hitting each other, bouncing around and doing their thing. When water freezes, those molecules, they essentially stop moving. That's what solid ice is. It's water molecules that are no longer moving. That's when they become ice. And then water vapor is when the water molecules, you know, in liquid, they're bouncing off each other, but they're kind of staying together. And water vapor in, in its gas form, the water molecules are just bouncing all over the place, like just going crazy. The reason water is a liquid on Earth at room temperature, there's there's three main reasons. One is that gravity is pulling them down. So it's the water molecules are pulled by gravity and collecting in the bottom of this cup. But gravity actually doesn't have very much of an influence on them. That's not the most important part. What's far more important is that water molecules are slightly attracted to each other. A part of the water molecule is positive and a part of the water molecule is negative. They have what you could sort of think of as a magnetic attraction to one another. And that's part of what keeps all of these water molecules here in liquid form. It stops them from, um, it stops the water from evaporating and just turning into a gas. And then the most important thing is air pressure. There is on top of this water, a whole bunch of air molecules, you know, the, the, our, our atmosphere, the entire depth of our atmosphere, all of that pressure, all of that weight of those gas molecules in our atmosphere is pressing down on the top of this water. And it's pressing down on this and keeping the water all together in my cup. If I were to remove all of the gas, the water would start to expand and eventually it would turn into water vapor. Here on Earth, the atmospheric pressure at sea level is about 14 pounds per square inch. There's 14 pounds of pressure per square inch pressing down on the top of this water. That's what's keeping it all together. That's what's keeping it down here in this cup. On Mars, because the atmosphere has dissipated, the atmospheric pressure is greatly reduced compared to the atmospheric pressure on Earth. And today, the atmospheric pressure on Mars is about 0.087 pounds per square inch, not even a single pound of pressure on Mars. Because of that, if I were to take this glass of water onto Mars, it would start to evaporate. Most of it would evaporate and some of it would turn into ice. And then that ice would slowly go through a process called sublimation. It would actually turn from ice into water vapor. When you melt ice on Mars, because the, the atmospheric pressure is so low, instead of turning into a liquid, it just turns right into a gas and it just starts bouncing around in the atmosphere. Now, we all learned about this in middle school, right? But if you'd like to really know the details of it, because we didn't, you know, when I was in school, I didn't learn much about the details of why this happens. If you really want to understand in depth why this happens, there is a wonderful video by another YouTube channel called Cody's Lab. And there, Cody actually takes a glass of water and he puts it into a vacuum chamber, reduces the atmospheric pressure in that vacuum chamber, and you watch the water boil at room temperature and you watch a chunk of that water freeze at room temperature. And he explains all of the physics behind what's going on there. It's really fascinating. So just to kind of sum things up here, scientists have found massive amounts of evidence that Mars used to have a thicker atmosphere and an ocean on its surface. According to our best estimates, the ocean looked something like this, and it covered about one third of Mars surface. So Ken Ham summarizes some of this information in his Mars exhibit. And then from that information, he explains, despite the fact that there is no known liquid on the surface of Mars, many scientists believe that Mars once suffered a flood of biblical proportions. 
Ironically, many of these same scientists deny that Earth, a planet 70% covered with water, ever had a global flood. So here in Ken Ham's Mars exhibit, we find that according to Ken Ham, a flood that covers one third of a planet's surface is a flood of biblical proportions. Meanwhile, right down the hall, there is another exhibit where Ken Ham explains that a flood of biblical proportions is a flood that covers an entire planet's surface. Anything else would be just ridiculous according to his interpretation of the Bible. In our last few videos on Archaeopteryx, we learned that Ken Ham's exhibits often contradict the findings of science. Today, right here, we've learned that Ken Ham's exhibits also contradict Ken Ham's other exhibits. Brilliant. Now, this looks bad enough for Ken Ham's Mars exhibit, but things actually do get worse. One of the main plaques in the Mars exhibit states the following. The rejection of the biblical flood is often due to evolutionary biases rather than the actual evidence. In fact, it is not a stretch to think that nearly every geologist would appeal to a global flood to explain many of Earth's features if the Bible had never mentioned such an event. So here, Ken Ham is claiming that the reason geologists believe there is no evidence for a global flood on Earth is because they want to believe in evolution instead and because they don't like the Bible. That is Ken Ham's claim. In the next video of this series, we're going to take a quick look through history to find out who was it that actually first discovered that geology does not support the idea of a global flood. Who was it that made that realization? Did it happen before the theory of evolution existed or after? the theory of evolution existed? Was the idea proposed by atheists that hated the Bible? Or was it proposed by faithful Christians who loved the Bible and lived their lives according to its teachings? I'm sure by now you can probably guess the answer to those questions, but it is going to be an exciting video next episode. The history of geology is absolutely fascinating. So long for now, and let me just remind you as I bid farewell, to please be kind to people in the comments section. What I'm doing in this video series is I'm revealing some major flaws with Ken Ham's teachings. And there are a lot of people that really love Ken Ham and they've been following him for a long time. Some of them have been giving him money. And when those people see how dishonest the man is in the displays that he's produced, when they begin to realize how inaccurate the things he teaches are, like that's just, <laughs> it's a painful realization and a lot of people there's this kind of, there's this grieving process that we go through. And you're going to see people in the comment section that are in denial about the, the reality of this. You're going to find people in the comment section that are really angry. Just let them blow off some steam. Let them say what they want to say. It's okay. We can be grown-ups about all this. So long.